get our songbooks, please. Let's turn to page number 75, and we ask you to stand and sing with the choir, Bound for the Promised Land, number 75. Shall we all stand and sing together? coming to pray for us. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. As you can tell, Pastor Walls is not here. He's in India, preaching there for Dr. P.D. Cherian in the South India Baptist Bible College. So let's be sure and pray for him. And Brother Charlie Taylor that is traveling with him. Let's pray together this morning, Matt. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning, Lord. Father, we thank you for the eternal life for all those who believe. Father, we pray you bless each of these here this morning. You meet every need here, Lord. We ask you to be with Brother Keith as he delivers the message this morning. Pray, Lord, if there's any here that's lost, that you'd, you'd, this would be the day for salvation. Yes. We ask you to be at the choir as they continue to sing. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Matt. You may be seated. The choir is going to sing for us at this time. <coughs>
Get our songbooks, please. Let's stand and sing a song we all know, number 56, When We All Get to Heaven. A song that we've known all our lives. Let's stand, please, and sing with the choir. coming down. We want you to fellowship one with another. Shake hands with those around you. Tell us it's good to see them in the house of the Lord. Baptist Church on this beautiful Lord's Day. Thank you so very much for coming. Maybe you're here today and this is your first time. You're our special guest. You're our visitors today and we thank you for coming. If you're here and visiting for the very first time or the first time in a long time, we'd like for you to take just a moment and uh, fill out a visitor's card, place it in the offering plate in just a few moments when we receive the morning offering. So if you're visiting this morning for the first time or the first time in a long time, would you lift your hand? Our ushers are here in the front. They're making the way toward the back. Brother Terry, right here. All right. Thank you, folks, for coming. God bless your heart. We certainly appreciate you being here. All right. Did we miss any? Brother Fred White, you ain't a visitor. <laughs> Brother Fred's got his hand up like this. How long have you been a member here, Brother Fred? About 40 years, that's what I was thinking. Long time. Yeah, is that what he's wanting, ink pen? <laughs> Amen. All right. Thank you again for coming. We appreciate you being here. I'm going to make just a couple of announcements at this time, and we'll take some prayer requests toward the end of the service. But as you can see by the banners hanging behind me, 
Uh, we've started our Sunday School campaign, our Spring Sunday School campaign, and it's entitled Spring Training in the Truth. Pastor Walls wanted something to go along with a the baseball theme this spring, and uh, uh, we talked about it and decided on Spring Training in the Truth. It's a six weeks campaign. Uh, first week already down. We start again and do it again next week. So I certainly want to invite you and encourage you to be a part of a Bible believing, Bible teaching Sunday school class here in Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. Also, I want to remind you that there are prayer rooms tonight for the men and the ladies of the church. Meet at 645. Come, come for a time of prayer. And then I want to remind you about the uh, bus breakfast along with the Sunday school teachers and assistants and class members breakfast next Saturday morning or this coming Saturday morning at 10 o'clock at the print shop. We had about 43, I think, Brother Tom said yesterday for the breakfast and then a time of visitation, making some contacts, people to be a part of this uh, Sunday school campaign. So we'll do it again this Saturday, 10 o'clock for breakfast at the print shop. And then the 29th, of March is take me out to the ballpark or take me out to the ball game. It's friend day. So friend day is fast approaching and uh, more details will be given out on friend day next week. Be sure and check the inside of the bulletin for the calendar of, for, of events that will be taking place this month and uh, hope you get involved and pray for the special events that are happening. Once again, we're delighted that you're here. Thank you for coming this day. Ushers, if you'll come, we'll receive the morning offering this morning. Brother Herman Daniels, would you come and pray for us, please? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for another opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for the, this day that you gave us. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. We pray, Father, if there's one here lost, they may see the need of Christ. Pray, Brother Keith, as you bring some message, Lord, just give and leave it to preach your precious word. For the offering received, Lord, it be used up building thy kingdom, Lord, that the, church, the ministry of this church may continue. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Herman. God bless you as you give this morning. <laughs> I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 3, if you would, this morning. Revelation chapter 3. Just before the message this morning, Donetta Harvey is going to sing for us.
If you would stand with me, we'll read Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Just the one verse this morning for our text. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Father in heaven, we certainly thank you again for this day. Thank you for the wonderful privilege to be in your house. Thank you for the opportunity to preach this morning, Lord, and I pray you'll help me to be a help and a blessing to, to those that are here. And Father, how I pray that you'll speak to hearts. Thank you again for your love, your mercy, your grace. Thank you for your word. Father, I do want to pray for our preacher as he's away. I ask that you might help him and bless him. Use him in a very special way. And Father, how I pray again. Meet each need here this day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I hope you're ready to meet the Lord. I hope you have that settled in your heart and your life. I hope there's no question about that. I think after the message this morning, you'll be glad to say once again that you know you're saved and you're glad you're saved. I speak on the subject this morning, tribulation and the earth dwellers. Tribulation and the earth dwellers. The message today is going to address the matter of what will happen to those that are left behind. What will happen to those who are left behind after the rapture of the church. What's going to happen to those who are left behind after God calls out His redeemed ones? He calls them up to meet Him in the air. What's going to happen to those that are left behind? Only those who are saved are going to go to be with the Lord in the air. Amen. The Son of God is coming for the sons of God. The Lamb of God is coming for the lambs of God. And the light of 
God is coming for the lights of God. What a wonderful occasion it'll be to be taken up to meet the Lord in the air and to be forever and ever and ever with Him. I love what the Bible says in John. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's what's going to happen to the saved. That's what's going to happen to the redeemed. But what's going to happen to those that are left behind? What's going to happen to those that remain on this earth? I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I want you to see what's going to happen to those who remain on the earth. Matthew chapter 24. Look, if you would, please, in verse 40. Matthew 24, verse 40. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. So we have an idea what's going to take place when the Lord comes. We're going to go, those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we'll go to meet Him in the air. But those who are not saved, they're going to be left behind. We find their description in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, our text verse. We find that they're going to dwell on this earth. They'll be dwellers upon this earth. Now then, I've tried to study a little bit about that phrase found in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. You'll see it over and over again in the book of Revelation. As a matter of fact, you'll find it 11 times in the book of Revelation. You'll find this phrase, them that dwell on the earth. It's a phrase that describes those who are going to be left when Jesus comes for his own. It's a phrase that describes those who are going to le be left behind. I found in my study that that phrase, the verb means this. The verb means to settle down. It means to live down. It's a picture here of a person who has made a decision about this earth. It's a picture here of a person who has decided that this earth is the only thing that they want, and they're going to become an earth dweller. Now then, I want to remind you of something, that the Bible never pictures the child of God as an earth dweller. The Bible pictures the child of God as strangers and pilgrims. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. It calls us strangers and pilgrims here on this earth. You see, that's what a stranger is. A God's, God's child is a stranger here on this earth. God's child is a pilgrim down here on this earth. A stranger is a person who is living temporarily in a land that he really doesn't belong to. God's children are never referred to as earth dwellers. We've not settled down in this world. Uh, we understand that we are strangers and pilgrims in this world and that we're just passing through. In Hebrews chapter 11, that great hall of faith chapter, Abraham, he confessed that he was a stranger and a pilgrim. And Abraham went out not knowing where he was going, but he was following the leadership of God. And God had revealed that Ab to Abraham that he was going to give him a better land than this land. So the Bible says that Abraham went out looking for a city. He was searching for a land that was fairer than day. Beloved, we must always understand and remember our pilgrim character. We don't belong down here. This world is not our permanent dwelling place. I thank God for heaven and the hope of heaven, don't you? I love what the old song says. It says, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me to heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. We need to always keep in mind the time of our sojourning here is just temporary. I'm sure that many of you have had the privilege to travel to a foreign land. Our preacher is in a foreign land this morning. He has already put his Sunday in. He's already worked, I'm sure, and preached many times this day. And he's resting now, I'm sure, because of the time change. But you can go to the room where our preacher is staying and you'll find a suitcase and a duffel bag in that room, hardly unpacked. You know why? Because that land is not his home. That home, that temporary place where he is now, is not his home. 
in just a few days, he'll be coming home. Beloved, that's the way it is with God's children. Just a few more days and we'll be going home. Did you know in a millisecond we could be face to face with Jesus Christ and be with him forever and ever and ever? You know, beloved, when we stop and think and we, we consider and we compare time with eternity, we understand that one of these days we're going to be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. You know, the things of this old world, the things down here, they're not really as important as we believe they are so we're strangers and we're pilgrims but there are those who will choose another world there are those who will choose I should say this world they choose not and they'll choose not to receive Jesus Christ as their personal savior they're described in Revelation chapter 3 in the last part of verse 10 as them that dwell upon the earth they're earth dwellers living down here. They've settled down here. Now the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, the Bible says that we are to set our affection on things above and not on things of this earth. But the earth dweller doesn't care. The earth dweller is dwelling on things of this earth. He's made a decision about this earth. And he's decided that this world is the only world there is. He's decided that this world is the only world that there's ever going to be. He's also decided that this world is the only world that he wants. And so by his own choice, he's become what the Bible calls an earth dweller. Now I want you to follow me this morning. And let's see what scripture says about the destiny of the earth dweller. The first of all, I want you to notice the consternation of the earth dweller the consternation of the earth dweller. There will come a time when an event will happen that will fill the mind of the earth dweller, fill their mind with consternation or with fear or with alarm or with dread. He'll wonder what's taken place. The earth dweller will, but it'll be too late for the earth dweller to do anything about what's taken place. The earth dweller has made an unfortunate choice. You know, choices in life are very important, are they not? The earth dweller is an earth dweller because he's made the wrong choice. For instance, he has chosen the wrong world. He's chosen this world over the next world. Now, the Bible says that we're to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And it goes on to say that if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And the Bible says that this world passes away. Uh, it says, in the lust thereof, and he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Beloved, I've got news for you. This is a passing world. This is a polluted world. This is a corrupted world. But the earth dweller doesn't look at it that way. The earth dweller doesn't see that at all. It really doesn't care about the next world. All they're concerned about is this world. They've decided that they're going to put their roots down in this world. They've made a wrong choice about the wrong world. Not only have they made a choice about the wrong world, but they've made a choice about the wrong word. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're told about the coming of the Antichrist and the impact of the Antichrist here in 2 Thessalonians. We're also told about the response to some of the people of the message of the Antichrist. Look, if you would, please, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I began reading in verse 10. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusions, that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see what I mean here? They've chosen the wrong word. They have rejected the word of the living God and substituted the word of the devil in the place of the word of God. Every man has to make a choice about the word he's going to, to believe. Every man has to make a choice, just like Adam and Eve had to make a choice in the Garden of Eden. Uh, you remember that God said you can eat of all of the trees of the garden except one. In the day that ye eat thereof, 
ye shall surely die. Well, the devil comes into the Garden of Eden, and he defies the Word of God. He comes and he says to Eve, ye shall not surely die. And they had to decide whose word they were going to believe. Well, you know the situation. They made a wrong choice. And as a result of their choice, they were expelled out of the Garden of Eden. I'm here to tell you today, beloved, I want you to please hear what I have to say. The same kind of choice comes to every man. It could be that there's someone here in this auditorium this morning. It could be there's someone here. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I'm here to tell you your only chance and your only hope is Jesus Christ. I tell you that as God's truth based on God's Word. But sitting right here today, maybe you're here and you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and the devil starts now, even now, with the lies he may say to you, when you die, there's no such place called hell. When you die, that's just the end. There's no life after death. And you've got to make a choice today, beloved. Friends, you have to make a choice today. If you choose to believe the wrong word, then you choose to be an earth dweller. You choose to believe the lies of the devil instead of the truth of God. So the earth dweller, he chooses the wrong world. He chooses the wrong word, and then he chooses the wrong wonder. I want you to go back, please, if you would, to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, it's talking about the coming of Antichrist and how he will do what he does and how he will be able to deceive the masses of people when he comes. Look at verse 9. Behold, I will make them, Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. The earth dweller chooses the wrong wonder, the synagogue of Satan. Now then, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 17, if you would, please. And I want you to see what the Bible says about the earth dweller that has chosen the wrong wonder. Revelation chapter 17, and I want you to look at verse 8. Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. The Bible says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition, and they that dwell, here's the phrase, they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. They've chosen the wrong wonder. But you know what Isaiah the prophet wrote? In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, Isaiah wrote this. Isaiah wrote, his name shall be called Wonderful. Oh, what a wonder is the person of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a wonder it is to receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior. But the earth dweller, he's chosen the wrong world. He's chosen the wrong word. And he's chosen the wrong wonder. According to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8, the earth dweller is an unsaved person. His name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8. So when the rapture comes, when that time comes, when we go to meet the Lord, those who are saved are going to be taken and the earth dweller are going to be left behind. Can you imagine the fear and the dismay that will fill their minds and will grip their hearts? I want you to think about it, if you would, please, this way. Here's a saved wife and an unsaved husband. She's prayed for him. She's loved him. She's done everything she has known to do, everything she knows to do to try to point him to Jesus Christ. And yet he's still unsaved. One day he's headed home after work. He pulls into the driveway and he gets out of the car and goes to the door and he walks in the door and as soon as he walks in the door he smells the aroma of food that was cooking. But all of a sudden he begins to look for his wife and he can't find his wife anywhere. No answer comes when he calls his wife's name because you see she was a citizen in heaven 
and the rapture had come and she was taken to meet the Lord but the unsaved husband is still left to live in this world. Or you might have a saved husband and an unsaved wife. You might have saved parents with unsaved children. You might have saved children with unsaved parents. Those who are saved, they're going to be raptured out of this earth and out of this world. But there are going to be those that will be earth dwellers and remain here on this earth. Can you imagine the fear and dismay, the consternation of the earth dweller? I need to move on. Let me mention secondly, the tribulation of the earth dweller. The tribulation of the earth dweller. Now, in our text here in Revelation chapter 3, it's said about the Philadelphian believers here. The Philadelphian believers, they represent saved people of this age. That Philadelphian kinds of believers, they are going to be kept from the hour of temptation. Did you see that in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, about the middle part of the verse there? They are going to be kept from the hour of temptation. That means when the hour of temptation shall come upon this world, it'll come on those who dwell on the earth. So you see, the earth dweller is going to experience tribulation. The earth dweller is going to experience in this earth what our Lord refers to as the great tribulation. Now, I just want to show you some of the characteristics of the tribulation in passing this morning of the earth dweller and what he's going to experience during the tribulation. Take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 13, if you would, please. One of the dominant themes of this is the activity of the Antichrist. Now, I'll be right up front with you. I don't know who the Antichrist is. I would not venture a guess. In all the ages of the Christian faith, people have tried to guess who the Antichrist might be. It's not for us to know who the Antichrist is, but it is for us to know that the Antichrist, he's going to be a magnetic, he's going to be a dynamic personality that's going to come on the scene. He'll deceive the whole world. You see, the earth dwellers, those that are left behind, those who have rejected Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, instead they will receive the satanic Savior. Revelation chapter 13 tells us about what life is going to be like for the earth dwellers during that period of time. It tells us what it's going to be like politically. In the opening verses here in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1, 2, and 3, and 4, we are going to see a couple of things here and a few things out of these verses. The Antichrist is probably going to come from the United States of Europe. In verse 2, we'll see that the dragon or the devil will give the Antichrist his power, will give him his seat, will give him his authority. In verse 3, we'll see that all the world, the earth dwellers, they'll wonder after him. In verse 4, they'll worship this beast. So in the first four verses, we're told that the Antichrist is coming. He's coming to rule the world. So his coming is going to be a political power. He's coming with this political power which has spiritual, religious overtones attached. And the earth dwellers, they're going to clamor to follow this, this leader, the Antichrist. They're going to fall right in line with the Antichrist. The earth dwellers, they've made a wrong choice. They've chosen this earth. It's the only world they know. It's the only world they want to know. And they've chosen to reject Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And they've chosen to be dominated by the Antichrist. That's how it'll be politically. How's it going to be economically? It's going to be like the following. If you would please look at Revelation chapter 13. Look in verse 6. Revelation chapter 13, verse 6. The Bible says this. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 16, the Bible says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hands and in their foreheads. We see here now then, those that are left, those the earth dwellers that are left upon the earth, they will receive a mark. 
And that word receive literally means this. It means to give themselves. It's a picture of them lining up to volunteer to receive the mark of the beast. The earth dweller is only interested in this world and what this world has to offer. Look, if you would, at Revelation chapter 17 and verse 2. Revelation chapter 17. Verse 2, the Bible says this, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornications. The earth dweller is drunk on the wine of the material things of this world. That's all they're interested in. That's all they want. He's so caught up in the gadgets and the toys of this world, and he sells his soul for this world and a mess of pottage of the material things of this world. They refuse Jesus Christ. And in that day, they're going to receive a mark. And the Bible tells us exactly where they're going to receive the mark. They're going to receive it in their right hand or in their forehead. And they'll receive that mark in order that they might be able to buy material things that form the whole sum and substance of their life. I can imagine it now as somebody walks up getting ready to receive their mark. I can imagine someone that says, all right, buddy, hit me with it right here. And he places his finger on the forehead, says, that's where I want my mark. He gets the mark. Do you know what the mark is? Can you help me? What is the mark? 666. That's found in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. And you can see that. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. It's interesting to note, beloved, it's interesting to note that the earth dwellers, they're reduced to nothing more than a number. Please hear me this morning. The devil always numbers his own. But you know what God does? I say glory to God this morning. God names his own. You're not a number with God, friends. You're a name with God. Oh, I... I tell you what, I'm saying about that this week, and I about had a spell. Matter of fact, I did have a spell. I got to thinking about that's what the earth dwellers are going to be reduced to. They're going to be reduced to nothing more than a number. But with God, we're not a number. With God, we're a name. The Bible tells me that God knows more about me than I know about myself. He tells me that the very hairs of my head are numbered. Not a number with God, we're a name. June 17, 1971, my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and a promise was given to me by the Word of God that He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I like the story about the census taker off in the mountains somewhere, and he knocked on the door. The lady came to the door, and he told the lady why he was there. And he said, All I want to know is the number of your children. And she said, well, there's Tom and Bill and Sue and Martha. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. He said, I don't want their names. I just want the number of your children. And she said, sir, my children don't have numbers. My children have names. And glory to God, that's the way it is with the Heavenly Father. God's children have names and not numbers. You're somebody special to God. You're somebody special to him. But if you're an earth dweller, you'll receive a number. The earth dweller doesn't have but one world, and he sells his soul for this world. And when the Antichrist gets control, the old earth dweller will, write, will line up and will receive his number. That's what will happen economically. What's going to happen religiously? I want you to look at Revelation chapter 13, if you would, please, in verse 8. Revelation chapter 13 in verse 8, and I'll hurry. Revelation 13, verse 8, the Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth, there's that phrase again, shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There will be religion during the tribulation days but it will be a religion of the worship of the Antichrist. Look, if you would, please, in verse 14, Revelation chapter 13, in verse 14, the Bible says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, 
saying to them that dwell on the earth, you notice the phrase, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. The earth dweller will say, we'll just build an image to this beast. We'll build an image. But right in the middle of the tribulation, there's something that is remarkable that's going to take place. There's something remarkable that's going to take place spiritually during the days of the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 11, in Revelation chapter 11, in the middle of the tribulation, there will be two witnesses that will come on the scene. Some have said Moses and Elijah. Some have said Enoch and Elijah. They'll come and they'll prophesy on the earth. And I believe it's by the witness of these two, te- by the testimony of these two witnesses, that there'll be 144,000 Jews that are going to be converted. That's found in Revelation chapter 7. As a matter of fact, turn there real quick. Revelation chapter 7. Look, if you would, please, in verses 13 and 14. One of the elders answered and said, Revelation chapter 7, verse 13, said unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That simply means this, that during the days of the tribulation, there are going to be some people that are going to be saved. They'll be saved, and I believe they'll be saved as a result of the testimony of these 144,000 Jews. You say, well, Brother Keith, that's good. That's good. That means that those earth dwellers, those who have chosen the wrong world, those who have chosen the wrong word, those who have chosen the wrong wonder, that means that some of them are going to have a chance, another chance. Well, I want you to follow me carefully now. Revelation chapter 11. It talks about these two witnesses in verse 3. And I'll give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred threescore days clothed in sackcloth. We're told about their their prophesying. In verse 7 now, it says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So verse 7 says that they're going to die. Those two witnesses will be killed. Now look at verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, which also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the graves. Can you imagine the scenes now? On the street, here are these two witnesses. They have been killed. Their bodies, three and a half days later, are still lying on the streets. Notice, if you would please now, what the Bible says in verse 10. The Bible says, and they that dwell, here's the phrase, they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. When these two witnesses are killed, the earth dwellers are going to begin to rejoice. The earth dweller has already made his decision about this world. He's already made his choice. So ladies and gentlemen, if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ in this age, if you choose the wrong world, if you choose the wrong word, if you choose the wrong wonder, if you choose the devil's Savior instead of God's Savior, and there is no hope for you in tribulation time. Now, I'll talk to you about the consternation or the fear of the earth dweller. We've talked a little bit about the Tribulation of the earth dweller. I close with this this morning. The condemnation of the earth dweller. Go to Revelation chapter 6, if you would, please. Revelation chapter 6. We have the seals that are given in Revelation chapter 6. In verse 9, we're told about the fifth seal. And that seal we see under the altar, the souls of them who were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Verse 10 We note this in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? There's that phrase again. The martyred believers, they cry out for vengeance. And in this context, the things that follow tells us what's going to take place for the earth dweller during this time. 
First of all, they're going to experience physical, physical devastation. Look, if you would, please, now in verse 12. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he'd opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sun, sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell upon the earth, or unto the earth, even as a fig tree casting her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Notice, if you would, please, verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That's physical devastation. Can you see the picture here in your mind? The impact of this picture in these verses that we just read. Those people that have decided for this earth, those people that have decided for this world, those people who have decided for the Satan's Savior instead of God's Savior, they have decided for this earth, they are called earth dwellers. They're not interested in the things of God. And all of a sudden, we see in this passage of Scripture in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12, 13, and 14, we see that the things that they have placed their hope in, we see that the things that they have chosen, all of a sudden began to fall apart. The Bible says there's a great earthquake. The sun becomes black darkness. The moon becomes a ball of blood. The stars begin to fall. The heavens roll up like a scroll. And the mountains and the islands, they are moved out of their places. Do you see what's happening now for the earth dweller? Can you see what's taking place? His world is going to pieces. His world is falling apart. That's physical devastation. But that's not all. They're spiritual their spiritual desperation. Look, if you would, please. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 15. The Bible says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Do you see the old, or the old earth dweller now? Can you see this crowd now? They're not as cool as they thought they were. Uh, they're not, uh, all of this crowd, they begin to lose their cool and they're not as cool as they thought they once were. Suddenly, spiritual realities begin to set in. Spiritual realities begin to sink into their heart and in a flash, they understand it all. They understand that God is real. They understand that sin is serious. And they understand that Jesus saves. So they begin to run to the mountains and the dens and they begin to hide themselves. But now notice verse 16 and 17. And they say to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Spiritual desperation. But it's too late. They've made the wrong choice. They chose this earth. I close with this verse. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. I want you to see it. Revelation chapter 12. And verse 12. Now I'm going to do something a little different here. I'm going to start reading in the middle of the verse. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. The Bible says this. It says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. But now I want you to notice the first word, the first part of the verse. It says, Therefore... Now it says, Rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. God's message to the earth dweller is a message of condemnation. But God's message to us, those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, it's a message of jubilation. He says, Rejoice. Ye that dwell, or rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. The good news is this, beloved. If you're here today and you're not saved, you don't have to be an earth dweller. You don't have to dwell on this earth. You can go to heaven. 
The Lord Jesus Christ has made that possible for you to escape the tribulation and being an earth dweller. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning. Father in heaven, we certainly want to thank you for your word. Lord, how I pray you'll speak to our hearts and be thorough with us in this time of invitation. I'm thankful that you have made a way for us to escape this tribulation. You've made us a, a way to escape being an earth dweller. Father, I thank you for that. And I pray you'll help us, Lord, to fix and focus our attention on thee now. Speak to our hearts. Help us to be sensitive to your leading and your guiding, I pray. In Jesus' name, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and no one's looking around. How many of you would say, Brother Keith, I can give testimony to the fact that I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior this morning. I can give testimony to the fact that I know I'm saved. Would you lift your hand way up high all over the auditorium? God bless you. That's a wonderful sight. I'm glad you can give that testimony. How many of us as Christians would say, Brother Keith, I know someone who is lost, though. I know someone that will be an earth dweller unless they receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And I'd like for you to pray with me, Brother Keith, that I could be the witness and the example and the testimony that I need to be so that I might be able to point them to Christ. Would you lift your hand? Let me pray with you. God bless you. My hand is up. I'll pray with you. You pray for me. <laughs> Beloved, to be an earth dweller, to be one left behind is going to be a terrible thing for any person to go through. You know that, and I know that. May the Lord help us. May the Lord help us to be concerned for the souls of lost men, women and boys and girls. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There's never been a time in your life that you have received Him. And if He came today, and He could come today, if He came today, you would be left behind. You'd be an earth dweller. And you say, Brother Keith, I sure would like for you to pray for me this morning. I don't want to be an earth dweller. I'm not sure I'm saved. And Brother Keith, I'm concerned and interested enough in my soul to ask you to be my friend. Pray for me. If that's you, would you let me pray for you? Would you lift your hand this morning? Not sure of your salvation. Would you lift your hand let me pray for you? Would there be any here this morning? I promise you I'll not embarrass you, but I will pray for you. Beloved, we all have loved ones and friends who don't know Christ as their Savior. I don't know about you, but I don't, want, I don't want them to be an earth dweller. May it be our prayer that the Lord would help us so that this judgment might be prevented for those that we know and love. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet, if you would, please, as we pray together. Father in heaven, now I pray you'll help us and use us as examples and testimonies that we need to be. Bless this invitation now. Meet the needs here, I pray in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And the ladies are playing softly for us right now. The hymn of invitation. This altar is open. If you're here this morning and you're not sure of your salvation, if you'll come, someone will take the word of God and show you what you need to do in order to be saved. Maybe you're here and you just want to come and thank the Lord for salvation. Maybe you're here and you'd just like to come and pray for those that you know will be left behind that the Lord would deal with their heart in tender mercy and loving kindness and they'd be saved before it's everlasting too late. Whatever the need is this morning as the ladies are playing for us and these are coming, if you need to come, I invite you to come. Would you come right now? Would you come?
going to sing a verse just like we would a regular church song. We're going to sing together. You lift up your voice and let's sing as we do. If you need to come, I invite you to come. Would you come? are bowed and our eyes are closed. They're going to play through a verse. Maybe you're here and you've been saved, but you've never made public in a church service. You've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you'll come, I'll tell the people why you're coming. We'll rejoice with you. Maybe you're here and you've been saved, but you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. I invite you to come. We can set up a time to take care of that matter. Maybe you're here and this is the church home you'd like to be a part of. Certainly, we invite you to come. Whatever the need is, as they play this verse for us, would you come? All right, you can be seated. I speak tonight on the subject, preach tonight on the subject, what's ahead for the Christian. So I encourage you to be back in the service this evening. What's ahead for the Christian? I don't want I don't want any of my friends or loved ones. I don't want anyone. I don't want anyone to be an earth dweller. May the Lord help us to be the examples that we need to be for his honor and for his glory. Well, let me give you some prayer requests. Of course, we need to pray for preacher. Brother Charlie Taylor is there in India. I help to Dr. P.D. Cherian and the South India Baptist Bible College. Please be sure and pray for them and for their safe return this week. The Oak Ridge Hospital, Leland Bowman, Betty McDougall, Harold Davis, Janice Darty, Brenda Haynes, or Hayes, excuse me, Brenda Hayes. These are in the Oak Ridge Hospital. I'm not sure, does anybody have a word on Don McKinney? Anybody have a word on him, an update? Got him listed. The preacher's got him listed in Chattanooga Hospital. Yes. Don McKinney has surgery at Oak Ridge Hospital tomorrow. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Pray for him. And then in the UT Hospital is Warren Lambert. What year is Warren? Is he a junior or a senior? Sophomore? Okay, sophomore. I told the Sunday school class this morning, I thought he was, well, I said sophomore, junior, didn't I? He's a sophomore recovering from an automobile accident this week, so please be sure and pray for him. And then we continue to pray for Elaine Weatherly. She's made some good progress this week. She smiled for the first time in about 11 days. Uh, she said, Mom. Uh, she stuck her tongue out at her mom. So she's making a little progress. She was able to sign her brother Keith's name. And uh, I want you to continue to pray for her. Uh, a little setback yesterday, the pneumonia full-blown again, so please pray for her. She has surgery scheduled for tomorrow. They'll place a permanent shunt in her body. Uh, so pray for Elaine Weatherly. Daisy Dunlap, Lenny Whalen, Lucille Bird, Irene Griffith, Beulah Thacker, Victoria Chesney. Um, all of these are home to my knowledge, so please pray for them. And then we express our sympathy, of course, to the Griffith family and the home going of Ardell Griffith this week. Any other special requests that you have that you want to mention this morning? Any other special request? I'm sorry. Ms. Paulette. Rosie Sexton's father, hospital in Nashville, diagnosed with cancer, and the doctors are giving no hope to the family. So please pray for this need. Her, 
Herbert Reader. All right, any others? Yes, Brother Clyde. All right. All right. We'll pray for him, Brother Clyde. Benita. All right. Terry. Someone else, special request that you have that you want to mention this morning. Any others? Yes. Unspoken. How many of you have an unspoken? There are many of us that do. All right, I saw one back. Yes. The White family, Ronald White family. Okay, any others? Brother Harvey, you know of any others that we've missed? Okay. If not, then if you'll stand to your feet, we'll have a word of prayer and be dismissed. Once again, thank you for coming today. May the Lord bless you. Brother Harvey, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer, please? Father, we thank you again for this day and the blessings that we've had by being in your house. For